Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Garigal people. I pay my respect to the elders, past, past, present, and emerging. Let me also acknowledge uh, Honorable Soroy Eoy, I can see him sitting down there, uh, the Minister for Provincial Office and Local Level Government, and also my Vice Minister, Honorable James Donald. Uh, I think I'm not sure if there's any other members of Parliament around, but if you're around, then thank you. Uh, I also acknowledge uh, Antonio Smaro and your team, the departmental heads and heads of agencies, uh, all our investors, uh, the participant, and a special mention to all our, all our landowners who have joined us. Okay, almost every speaker that came, you know, we acknowledge the traditional landowners of this beautiful land. So I assume you all know about the, uh, the Mabo case. You know, Eddie Mabo is a, is a landowner like every one of us in PNG, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he's a landowner and he's uh, Miriam people from the Torres Strait Island. They uh, challenged the, the legal doctrine of terra nullis, which, uh, which considered Australia to be uh, uninhabited before the arrival of the, uh, the uh, people who came and settled, the Europeans. It is a landmark legal case in Australia that fundamentally changed the country's legal approach to land rights and recognized the concept, concept of native title. In PNG, in Papua New Guinea, over 95% of land is owned by, some, by, uh, by somebody, particularly our landowners. And there is always someone who will claim ownership over any, any piece of land in Papua New Guinea. And that goes back to our customs. You know. So accordingly, that entitlement to the land and the resource found on or within that land is of significant cultural value to the people of Papua New Guinea. It is quite a sensitive matter of significant importance, and uh, it is prudent that our investors take that into account when you come and you know, do your business in our country. Almost every Papua New Guinean citizen is a landowner, and we hold land so dear to our, to our heart. So, uh, however, even though we place a strong cultural value on, land, on the land, our people respect the law. We uphold the law, and we respect the arguments that we have with our investors and our development partners. And that has been emphasized by our Prime Minister and other leaders since the uh, con convention started. So let me quote what the Prime Minister said yesterday. He said, PNG is a fair democracy with an independent judiciary and passing is our quality. For those of you who don't know what passing means, passing is a pidgin word. It means uh, goodwill, generosity, and maybe the willingness to do what is right. That's passing. So the law basically gives a clear definition on ownership of, of minerals. Under the Mining Act, it says, I'll read what it states in the Mining Act, it says, all minerals existing on, in, or below the surface of any land in Papua New Guinea, including any minerals contained in any water line on any land in Papua New Guinea, are the property of the state. So that is very clear. Uh, that's section five subsection one of the of, of the mining act subsection two basically uh, qualifies the issue of ownership and states that this ownership of minerals by the state is not in, inconsistent with section 53 of the constitution section 53 of the constitution talks about uh, protection from un, unjust deprivation of property so subsection two says that this law is consistent with the constitution i'll explain it later uh, the Oil and Gas Act is also similarly, similarly weighted, weighted uh, to the Mining Act. So there are two types of rights under the Constitution. We have the fundamental rights, uh, basically the right to life, freedom from inhuman treatment, and uh, protection of the law. And we have the other rights, which are called the qualified rights. So that's found under Section 38 to 56 of the Constitution. It spells out the general qualification of these qualified rights and what constitutes those rights. So you will find in all our legislation, acts of parliament will always declare up front that this act complies with the constitutional requirements. So that's a common 
uh, provision you'll find, especially in section one of all the legislations. So under the Mining Act 1992, it's, it states that for purposes of section 53.1 of the Constitution, the purpose and reason for which the Mining Act permits possession, possession or interest of rights to be compulsorily acquired are declared to be for public purposes, and mining in Papua New is in the national interest. Therefore, the management and regulation of the mining and petroleum sector remains a function of the national government in order to save the national interest. Uh, let, let me just ask, who has read the constitution of, the, of Papua New Guinea? Anyone has read it? Put your hands up. I know I, I'm not in a, there's some few uh, lawyers here. I know everyone is a miner or associated with mining. Well, please take some time to read the constitution. It's a very interesting document, piece of document. It sets the foundation of all the laws we have in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it also sets the direction which the country should be moving, moving forward towards. And it guides the conduct of all the citizens and investors who come comes into the country. Our constitution is autochthonous. It is homegrown. Uh, it sets out the aspirations of our forefathers and gives our mandate. All our mandate, mandate of every sector in Papua New Guinea is found in the constitution. So that's why it's very important that you read it to understand. Uh, for the resource and economic sector in PNG, the Constitution set, sets out some uh, aspirations and mandates, and I just want to read some of them. Uh, the national goals and directive principle calls for national sovereignty and self-reliance. It states, we declare our third goal to be for Papua New Guinea to be politically and economically independent, and our economy basically self-reliant. We accordingly call for, among other things, one, strict control of foreign investment, capital, and wise assessment of foreign ideas and values so that this will be subordinate to the goal of national sovereignty and self-reliance, and in particular, for the entry of foreign capital to be geared to internal social and economic policies and to the integrity of the nation and the people. And two, uh, the state to take effective measures to control and e actively participate in the national economy, and in particular, to control major enterprises engaged in the exploitation of our resources. So that is found in the Constitution. Uh, the National Goals and Directive Principle also calls for natural resource and environment, and it states, we declare our fourth goal to be for Papua New, Guinea, Papua New Guinea's natural resource and environment to be conserved and used for the collective benefit of us all and be replenished for the benefit of future generations. And the Constitution further declares that, you know, every citizen have an obligation to themselves, their descendant, and every other nation uh, to each other and to the nation to use profits from economic activities in the advancement of our country and our people, and that the law may impose a similar obligation on non-citizens carrying on economic activities in or from, the, from our country. So that's, I'm just speaking from what's in the Constitution. So you, you wonder, why am I talking about the Constitution in a mining and petroleum conference? You know, the, as I've mentioned earlier, the Constitution is the basis upon which laws and government policies are developed, which allows for our investors to come into our country to develop the resources found within our jurisdiction. I am stating the aspirations of our forefathers in the Constitution simply because uh, my department did some, bit, some consultations throughout the years, and we've identified some predominant issues. And I wish to point out a few of them, which are quite sensitive, and some of them are gaining momentum throughout the country. So I'll just go through about six of them. One. There are calls for PNG to move away from the current concessional regime and production sharing regime, and our uh, Minister for Petroleum alluded to that this morning. Two, there are also calls for transfer of mineral ownership rights away from the state. Three, there are calls for an increase in royalty from the agreed 2% rate that is currently applic applicable. Uh, we have seen Pogara apply at a 3% rate by agreement between the state and Barrick New Guinea Limited. Four, there are calls for downstream processing of minerals extracted from within PNG soil. Five, there are calls for greater participation by our people in the, in the equity option. Again, we have seen significant, significant increase in both Octeri and Pogera in state equity, which also increased the land on equity and the, and the provincial government's equity. And six, there are calls for greater participation under the national content aspirations of the national government. And there are lots of other predominant issues that we have identified ju during our consultations. So the people who are, are calling for this have very strong sentiments. 
those strong sentiments are held by our people. And even though they're, they're quite passionate about it, you know, they still respect the rule of law. And they try to put the arguments properly, you know, following the due process to us to address those issues. So I am raising these issues here at this conference because we cannot ignore these issues. They won't go away. They won't just go away. We have to, we have to attend to them. You know, so both the government and the industry must not shy away from these issues. We must work together to address these sensitive issues. So as the government, when we did our consultation, uh, we have taken steps to address those issues when they first arose. We assured the proponents of those, uh, each of those issues that the mineral policy and legislative review exercise that was being undertaken by my department would adequately address those in consultation with the, with the uh, industry. However, there were pro prolonged delays in introducing the uh, revised mining act, and these issues are beginning to emerge again. So we need to address those issues again. Yeah, so the sooner we address those issues, the better for us. So my department, the Department of Mineral Policy and Geohazard Management, uh, has undertaken the initiative to conduct the mineral policy and legislative review exercise, and you know, it holds a lot of significance for the PNG mining sector. The Mining Act 1992 you know, is the cornerstone of our regulatory framework, and it plays a crucial role in shaping the future of the mining in industry in Papua New Guinea. So we recognize the dynamic nature of the mining sector and the evolving global standards. And when we're doing the review, we aim for certain things, four main things. One, to adopt international standards. Two, codify the current practices and government policy directives. Three, align with new developments in the mining sector. And four, strengthen the regulatory requirements of the legislation. So those were the four main things that we used when we started doing the review of the uh, Mining Act 1992. So we want to ensure that PNG, you know, mining regulatory framework aligns with current changing circumstances and best uh, industry practices. In addition, in 2024, the following new policy uh, developments will, will go before cabinet for endorsement. And uh, we've had our discussions with the mining industry on these policy developments. These policy developments are as follows. There's six of them. One is the mining policy, replacing the mineral policy of Papua Nini. Two is the offshore mining policy. Three, the sustainable mining development policy. Four, mining involuntary resettlement policy. Five, the mining project rehabilitation and mine closure policy. And six, the geohazard management policy, which is the other function of my department. Very important because we currently have uh, volcanoes erupting all over the place, earthquakes. We, we monitor those. So we need to have that policy in place as well. So for a consultation with the industry, we have had a thorough and rigorous engagement for a couple of years since 2014 onwards. So the consultation was between the state working group and uh, what we call the industry working group. And you know, it's quite pleasing to note that you know, those representatives who are representing the industry, like our current president, our good president, and a couple of other members who are now uh, executive of the, of the core, they were, they were quite uh, active in those, in those negotiations. So I appeal to those who were involved in the, in the review and the president, please work with us. Let's get this over the line. The longer we delay, anything could happen. So let's, let's uh, get the revised act enacted as soon as we can by next year. So in a meeting in Brisbane last, on the 17th of January 2020, just before the COVID lockdown, uh, the state gave an undertaking to the chamber that the revised act will come into effect in 2025, when Papua New celebrates its 50th independent anniversary. So that is the reason why we held the uh, legislation back and have not introduced it to date. But, you know, change is inevitable. Huh? It is a fact of life. The status quo will sooner change, uh, sooner or later change. It has been 30 years since the enactment of the Mining Act 1992. While the act is functional in its current format, there are new practices and developments that needs to be codified for regulatory purposes, as stated by my uh, managing director before me. So therefore, in the first part of uh, 2024, my department will send out notices inviting uh, comments and inputs from every one of you. So I encourage all investors, landowners, government agencies, NGOs, the general public to participate. Your insight and perspective will 
be very invalu invaluable in shaping a regulatory framework that we hope will foster innovation, sustainability, and resp responsible mining practices in Papua New Guinea. I also encourage each one of you individually to participate in this final consultation. You know, let's be architects of a positive change in the way we do business in, in the PNG mining sector. Together, let's forge a future for the mining sector that is not only economic, economically viable, but also socially and environmentally responsible for a mutual prosperity for both the investor and the people of Papua New Guinea. I look forward to, to your active participation in the upcoming review exercise of the Mining Act 1992 next year. Thank you, Tru. Good luck, Vinun Dupla.